Democrats have reached an agreement on a $1.75 trillion social spending plan. That includes child care, clean energy, Medicare expansion, and more. We have coverage from our Washington bureau. And a Tucson native is competing on a 15-man rugby team against one of the top teams in the world. Plus, how ghostly adventures are helping the economy in small towns like Tombstone. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Kylie Cochran. And I'm Rudy Cavazos. Thank you for joining us. It's trimmed down, but it's still historic. That's how Democratic leaders framed a deal for President Joe Biden's signature Build Back Better plan that was unveiled on Capitol Hill today, as Simon Williams reports from our Washington bureau. Democrats today announced an agreement on President Joe Biden's Build Back Better plan that would cut the size of the plan down from $3.5 trillion to $1.9. But even that was not enough for congressional Republicans. Arizona Representative Andy Biggs, flanked by fellow Republicans at a Freedom Caucus news conference, railed against the Democrats' plan. This is a bad plan. It's bad for individuals. It's bad for families. It's bad for businesses. And it's bad for America. The plan would increase funding for everything from child care to Medicare. President Joe Biden said it would not add to the long-term deficit, but would be paid for with new taxes on the most wealthy. He hailed the historic nature of the package. I know we have a historic economic framework. It's a framework that will create millions of jobs, grow the economy, invest in our nation and our people. The biggest ticket items are $400 billion for child care and universal preschool for six years and more than $500 billion of clean energy investments. Democrat Rokan of California called the clean energy funding vital, but that progressives won't be satisfied until there's a done deal. But it's still coming together, and we're not a going to vote on the infrastructure bill until we have a reconciliation bill with strong climate provisions, and we've been pretty consistent on that. And although today's announcement was an important step in what Democrats are calling a historic shift in government priorities, it was just that, a step, as neither the House nor Senate has laid out a timeline for when a vote will be brought to the floor. In Washington, Simon Williams, Cronkite News. We reached out to members of Arizona's congressional delegation for reaction, but most said that they were too busy or hadn't yet seen the framework. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema, who had been a key Democratic stumbling block to the plan, in a tweet said only that negotiators have made significant progress and that she looks forward to getting this done. The city of Phoenix is reporting record sales tax revenue even after the hotel industry took a major hit from the COVID-19 pandemic. The city's economic indicators report found tax revenue from hotels and motels decreased by almost 40 percent and city earnings from bars and restaurants fell by 10 percent. Meanwhile, both construction and retail saw increases. The Phoenix Budget and Research Director says federal stimulus checks sent to Phoenix households did their job by preventing severe economic decline for the state and city. A healthy lifestyle for children means more than just a healthy diet, according to a national study. Cronkite News reporter Alyssa Stoney talks with the lead researcher about how this could affect a child's health throughout their lifetime. The microbiome is a mix of trillions of microscopic organisms within the digestive tract that protects against specific pathogens, helps with growth and development, and influences how children respond to vaccines. The MCS of the family was predictive of, um, of different organisms or the abundance of different organisms living in children's microbiome. And this can have really important implications for understanding how our early life environments can shape one's health um, throughout the lifespan. Socioeconomic status relates to the family's income, educational attainment, financial security, and social class and status, according to the American Psychological Institution. So I just think that like understanding that the early environmental exposure of the children of our children really matters for the overall health of our country. Candace Lewis, assistant professor with ASU and TGen, says the research should encourage policymakers to consider giving families adequate resources and access to nutrition while lowering stress in their lives. Alyssa Stoney, Cronkite News. TGen will continue to look at children's gut and microbiomes and the different microorganisms within a child to determine if it is affecting their long-term health. Today, the Interior Department made draft guidelines for a new conservation corps. Native American tribes, along with Native Hawaiians and Alaskan Native corporations, gave feedback on the guidelines. It will also let young Natives work on projects that directly benefit their communities. The Interior Secretary said that this program could transform the lives of Native youths. 
Coming up, one Tucson athlete takes the field with the U.S. national rugby team. He tells us what it's like to play on the big stage. And the Lowell Observatory is reopening next month. What we tell you what you need to do to get general admission when we come back. I was so excited when I learned that I was gonna be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Eiffel. And what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving in whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. When you support Arizona PBS, you plant a seed. Seeds that provide educational outreach in our community. Seeds that put our digital resources to work. Seeds that foster the trusted news coverage you expect from PBS. And seeds that continue the amazing PBS programs you love. But our garden can't keep growing without your support. Visit our website to see all the ways you can help our garden grow. Plant a seed with Arizona PBS today. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons, your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. The U.S. issued its first passport with an ex-gender designation, an action viewed as a milestone in recognizing the rights of people who don't identify as male or female. Anyone applying for a passport or consular report of birth abroad can mark an ex-gender if they identify as non-binary, intersex, or gender non-conforming. Previously, applicants needed a medical certification if their self-selected sex marker didn't match the sex listed on other official identity documents. The State Department says it is still updating its systems and forms for the new policy, and it expects to be able to offer the option more broadly next year. Tucson native Ryan Matias took his love of rugby to an international stage last weekend in Washington, D.C., playing for the U.S. national team in the inaugural 1874 Cup against New Zealand's famed All Blacks. The final score wasn't close, but fans did not leave disappointed, as Cronkite News reporter Simon Williams tells us from our Washington Bureau. Around 40,000 people came to the home of the NFL's Washington football team to see the best ruggers in the U.S. play the best in the world. And the top-ranked All Blacks lived up to the hype. Trouncing the USA Eagles 104-14 on Saturday. U.S. Eagle Ryan Matias knew it would be tough going in. Uh, one of our coaches says, you know, you can't cover every blade of grass. You just, you can't. Something's got to be open. So, mm -hmm. um, and they're very good at identifying and communicating where that space is and attacking it. The former University of Arizona standout started the Come second on. half with a score. Matias on that far side. It was just the second Eagles Matias try score. against the All Blacks in the history of the matchup. Fans from around the globe looked past the lopsided score to enjoy the festive environment. Andrea Davenport of Mesa, who came with club rugby teammates, got into the Halloween spirit and dressed as Mario characters. Hey, what's this all about? They see the fun in rugby and maybe they want to get their kids involved. Maybe they want to, you know, and then we get back in that same, that same token. So it's just about getting the general public involved and like loving the game. But the day was especially meaningful for Ryan's dad, who got to see him suit up against the mighty All Blacks. New Zealand is the I mean, where, do you, where do you go from here on this planet when you're playing rugby and play against the All Blacks? The match ends the U.S. international season, but if you're around Tucson, you might see Matias working with the Tucson Rugby Club. 
In Landover, Simon Williams, Cronkite News. Organizers of the 1874 Cup hope it spurs U.S. interests in the game and in Major League Rugby, but they also hope it helps the U.S. land the Men's Rugby World Cup in 2027 or 2031, or the Women's in 2029. And they say Glendale is one of the cities that could be in their bid. The Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff is reopening next month for general admission. The observatory is reopening on November 15th after being closed and having limited programming because of the pandemic. To get general admission, anyone over the age of 12 must show proof of a negative COVID test in the last 72 hours or show proof of vaccination. Children ages 2 to 11 are not required to show a negative test, but will need to wear a mask. Now it's another nice day here in Phoenix and we've been in the 70s and 80s all day. Alyssa Stoney is in the Weather Center to update us on how it's going to look for the rest of the week. I'll have what we can expect for this weekend and into next week, but first let's take a look at the rest of our country. California experienced some wind and rain the past couple of days, and the East Coast is going to be seeing those rainstorms too. Boston and New York can expect heavy wind and rain, as well as some rainstorms in the Cincinnati and Nashville area. But here in the Valley, we're not going to be seeing any of those rainstorms. Our high for tomorrow is 92 degrees in Phoenix and 90 degrees down in Tucson, and then moving up to the 60s and 70s as our high for the northern part of our state. And our lows for the state is going to be in those 50s and 60s with 60 degrees as our low for Phoenix and 56 degrees down in Tucson. Up north, we're going to be freezing temperatures for our low with 32 degrees at the Grand Canyon in Flagstaff. As we move into the weekend, we'll be warming up a little bit with our high being 92 degrees on Friday, 88 on Saturday. And for Halloween, our high is going to be around 86 degrees with some cloud coverage. Our low, though, is 61 degrees, which may mean that around trick-or-treating time, it might be cool outside. As we move into next week, we'll be in those low to mid 80s with some cloud coverage on Monday and Tuesday and our lows remaining in those 50s to 60s. In the Weather Center, Alyssa Stoney, Cronkite News. All this week, we're highlighting efforts to stop misinformation. It's all a part of Media Literacy Week. Tonight, Jordan Spurgeon explains the different types of misinformation and the harm they can do. In the past few years, the term fake news has been frequently thrown around, but that's a very broad term. First Draft, a nonprofit coalition tackling information disorder, identifies seven types of myths and disinformation. Number one, satire or parody, which does not have an intention to harm, but can fool people. Number two, misleading content, which frames an issue or individual in a misleading way. Number three, imposter content, which masquerades as a legitimate source. Number four, fabricated content, which is completely false and intends to harm. Number five, false connection, where content, including images, don't support the content. Number six, false context, where legitimate content is shared with contextual information that is incorrect. Number seven, manipulated content, where legitimate content is changed to create a false narrative. If you ranked these in terms of harm, satire or parody would be low, and manipulated content would cause the most harm. You can find more information about media literacy and how to fight misinformation on our website, cronkitenews.azpbs.org. I'm Sean DePaz. Coming up after the break, I'll have your Cronkite Sports Report. We'll give you an update on a former ASU bat men's basketball player who exchanged his maroon and gold for purple and black this season. I was so excited when I learned that I was going to be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Eiffel. And what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving of whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. When you support Arizona PBS, you plant a seed Seeds that provide educational outreach in our community. Seeds that put our digital resources to work. Seeds that foster the trusted news coverage you expect from PBS. And seeds that continue the amazing PBS programs you love. But our garden can't keep growing without your support. Visit our website to see all the ways you can help our garden grow. 
Plant a seed with Arizona PBS today. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons. Your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. Welcome back. I'm Sean DePaz, and here is your Cronkite Sports Report. Cardinals fans, brace yourself. The J.J. Watt injury might be worse than we thought. The Cardinals ruled Watt out for tonight's game with a shoulder injury, but now ESPN's Adam Schefter is reporting that the, def that the defensive end may, may need season-ending surgery. There is some good news, however. Schefter also reported that wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins, who was, who was listed as questionable for tonight's game, is expected to play. The Cardinals put their unbeaten record on the line tonight as they host the Green Bay Packers, arguably the best matchup in the NFC this year. Though the Cards recognize the greatness of the Packers, they're focusing on themselves ahead of tonight's game. It's, it's business. It's business as usual. Um, you know, all we're focused on is, is ourselves, really. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who lines up on the other side. It's about us. And, uh, you know, as long as we execute the right way, as long as we... Um, you know, put in the right preparation, um, you know, physically, mentally, it, everything should work out. And so, you know, we have the players, we have the leadership, we have, um, you know, the ability to, to go out there and handle business. We just, we just have to, to make sure we're putting in the work. We are just under two weeks away from the tip-off of the college basketball season. And for Arizona State men's basketball, it's a chance at redemption after a disappointing season last year. It will be an almost entirely new roster for the Sun Devils this season, with nine newcomers between freshmen and transfers. Notable returning players include star sophomore Marcus Bagley, junior big man Jalen Graham, and fifth-year senior Kamani Lawrence. Last year, the, the Sun Devils allowed the most rebounds and second-most points per game in the Pac-12. Coach Bobby Hurley has made it a key focal point for his team in the lead-up to their season opener against Portland. I think re rebounding overall, just because I'm scarred from last year on that one category, has been you know certainly a point of emphasis. So we've tried to simulate the conditions of the horn sounding if if someone misses a block out or doesn't go rebound, misses an assignment. So trying to say, hey, if you don't you're not willing to do this, then you're going to hear the horn sound, you're going to come out of the game. So we're trying to rehearse that in practice. Former Sun Devil player Tayshawn Cherry will be wearing the black and purple this season, fresh off his transfer to GCU. Reporter Jackson Coppinger went to get a feel for how the forward is transitioning in his new basketball environment. There's a new lope on campus at GCU, but last year he was hooping across town for Arizona State. Tayshawn Cherry is a 6'8 forward now entering his senior year with the GCU squad fresh off a tournament run last season and is happy with the change of scenery here. Everybody's more calm, it's just more relaxed in this environment. I feel like uh, we get better every day, we're working hard, everybody on the team is accepting. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm blessed to be here. So. Cherry was mostly noted for his marksmanship from three back at Arizona State. He dropped 55 threes for the Devils in his first couple seasons there. The offense might be different here at GCU, but coach Bryce Drew says the three ball isn't going anywhere for Cherry. We really liked his ability to shoot the basketball. Um, it's hard to find a lot of uh, players at his size, six foot eight, that can step out and shoot it like a guard. So that was the initial thing that really stood out to us. Cherry wasn't the only former Devil to transfer to GCU, though. Point guard Holland Woods committed to the Lopes this summer as well, and he knows that number 35's energy will have a big impact on the program. He can lift the room, um, so his presence is felt all the time, and. A lot of guys don't have that. A lot of guys can't bring that to the table. So to have someone 
they can do something like that like all the time. It's, it's unmatched. If one thing is for sure, that energy will be present when GCU pays Arizona State a visit in December. A rematch from last year's one-point victory by ASU and GCU Arena. Cherry knows the importance of that game, but is also more than confident with this Lope squad against any of the bigger opponents in the power conferences. Yeah, I think we're up there with everybody else. I think we could, you gotta lace them up just like we do, so I think we can come out and beat anybody in the country. So um, I'm confident in our team, and I think Coach Drew is too, so. And we like where we are right now. Um, we just need to keep improving uh, the program, improving our roster, and uh, keep trying to elevate um, you know, to higher levels. Which means making it back to the big dance. Making it past the first round would just be the cherry on top. In Phoenix, Jackson Coppinger, Cronkite News. The Suns' early season woes continued last night in a home loss to the Sacramento Kings. Phoenix took an eight-point lead into halftime, but that was erased with an ice-cold third quarter, scoring only 15 points. The two teams battled in the fourth, but it would be the Kings' Harrison Barnes nailing a three-pointer as time expired to secure the win. The Suns now sit at 1-3 and three on the season. And that's a wrap on today's Cronkite Sports Report. Back to you, Kylie and Rudy. Towns in Arizona, like Tombstone, are known for their ghost stories. When we come back, how these towns make a profit from ghost tourism. I was so excited when I learned that I was gonna be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Eiffel. And what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving in whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. When you support Arizona PBS, you plant a seed. Seeds that provide educational outreach in our community. Seeds that put our digital resources to work. Seeds that foster the trusted news coverage you expect from PBS. And seeds that continue the amazing PBS programs you love. But our garden can't keep growing without your support. Visit our website to see all the ways you can help our garden grow. Plant a seed with Arizona PBS today. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons, your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. Several places in Arizona are known for their ghost stories that capture the attention of many, especially during the month of October. Cronkite News reporter Carolina Hassett visited a town to see how ghost tourism plays a role in the local economy. The attacker is in the window right now watching us. It is angry. It's the time of year where many people are eager to come in contact with the paranormal. You saw the curtains move? That's not uncommon. And the city of Tombstone is the perfect place to potentially come in contact with the afterlife. Any town that has a myth or a legend is, is good for a tour, and this town certainly has that. The Wild West town relies heavily on tourism and is still recovering from the impact of COVID-19. It kind of became a ghost town in a way. I mean, it was a tough year here. However, the town has seen more people coming back recently with help from friends on the other side. And it's also got a reputation for being haunted. So uh, people definitely want to come back. It's just a question of how quickly and, and when. Freaky Foot Tours and Flagstaff say they are thriving after extending tours beyond October this year. 
in the three weeks we operated last October, we had over a thousand percent increase in business from our previous year. And we're on track to have a 700% increase this year from last year. But Jones also thinks his tours attract a large crowd because of something else. Things that create ghosts generally aren't like happy stories. So there's also a lot of true crime. There's a lot to get out of it, regardless of what you're into. And a lot of those tourism dollars come from locals. We have a lot of people who just drift down from other parts of Arizona who say, you know, I've lived here all my life and I've, I've seen the movie Tombstone a million times, but I've never been to Tombstone. But there seems to be one place many of the tourists want to visit. One stop on the tour that is considered a crowd favorite is the Birdcage Theater, one of the most haunted places in the town, where up to 29 entities have been detected. In Tombstone, Carolina Hassett, Cronkite News. According to the Tombstone Chamber of Commerce, ghost tours bring business. However, television shows about their ghostly history bring the town even more attention. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.